Hello, I'm Debbie Crawford and we're here with legislation and Randy Fry has agreed to come in with us today. Randy, I'm glad you could be here. Oh, Deb, thanks for having me in. Oh, you're welcome. This is wonderful. So now we get a better understanding of legislation by you coming in and explaining some of it. Right. It's a uh, legislative session is off and running. We've had our first week and so uh, a lot of things are happening at State House. Now, one of the bills that's coming up is a helmet bill. Uh -huh. Now, that's not a helmet for a motorcycle. No. We want to make sure everybody understands right. that. So, right. what is that for? Well, the helmet bill came from a, a, a lady whose son was injured in a traumatic incident. And uh, he was uh, has a brain injury because he didn't have a helmet on. And she brought me this bill, and uh, it had been around before. Other legislator had had it, and it didn't go anywhere. And she's very passionate about it and she asked me if I would carry it. And so I looked at the bill and determined that I would carry it under uh, one condition. And that is uh, if any child who couldn't afford a helmet got one for free. And so what the bill does is it requires any 17-year-old uh, or younger while they're riding a bike, a scooter, on public property, not your residential, not home, but on your public mm -hmm. property, to wear a helmet. But again, if your family is uh, unable uh, financially to provide the child with a helmet, they can get one for free. And we've partnered with the Indiana Volunteer Firefighter Association and the Indiana Professional Firefighters to uh, provide the helmet and fit it to the child so the right helmet goes on the right child. The helmets will be donated in the beginning and, uh, and then replenished uh, through the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. And that's any child that wants to buy a bicycle or right. there's they have the access to get a helmet. They will. Uh, and the law would go into effect uh, July 1 of 2020, but the penalty phase, which is a $25 fine, would go into effect a year later, giving folks a, a year to uh, learn about the law. Uh, but it's also a, a May provision. So a police officer may give someone a ticket for not having a helmet on, but most likely what they'll do is mention to them that they should be wearing a helmet or yeah, in some cases provide a helmet because public safety has access to the helmets, not just fire department. Well, that's, there's no reason a child will go without a helmet then, is there? Well, Deb, let's talk about what happens if you have an accident uh, and you're not wearing a helmet. Um, first off, the life of the individual is devastated. Um, it's changed forever. It, it's changed forever. Um, my daughter uh, and my son-in-law had a little girl, our granddaughter, uh, who had cerebral palsy. And although I understand that uh, was a birth injury and not a, a, a traumatic injury, the result's the same. It's a brain injury. And the fact that this child is not going to grow up and be a normal child and, and ride a bicycle and, and go to school and, and have a normal life is devastating to the parents. Um, then the, the uh, fact is that this child is not going to be an adult and be able to take care of themselves long term. And so uh, this is a continued stress on that family for years to come after, uh, after this incident. And then you look at the financial burden, the financial burden on the family who uh, has all these medical bills and continual medical bills for this young uh, individual. Uh, at, they're devastated again financially. And then at the state level, the burden on the state is very expensive as well. So um, my thinking is if we can prevent a child from having a traumatic brain injury and we can uh, allow them to live a normal life and not suffer this terrible thing, then we should do it. But we should not have any child sitting on the sidewalk and not able to ride their bicycle or their scooter because they uh, can't afford a helmet. Right. That would, that would not be good for the child. No, and I can see children in that position, and I, I don't want to put a child in that position. We want to make life better for them, not, right. not uh, anything less. Better quality of life, a little right. safer. That's right. So That's right. That would be great. Now, one of the other things you have coming up is the uh, Common School Fund. Right. Uh, and, and, and what that is, uh, Deb, is there's a, um, uh, a grant that you can apply for, school corporations can apply for, through the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. And this grant uh, allows a school corporation to harden the school itself for storm damage. So for instance, you might want to make your gymnasium uh, something that could withstand a, a massive tornado. Uh, you can do that with this grant, that's what it's for. 
However, the school corporation is required to put up 25%. Which is difficult Which sometimes. is very difficult. It's not in their normal budget. Right. And so uh, some school corporations have done it. I believe uh, Salem Schools has done that. And if you re might remember probably 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, the town of Henryville was destroyed and the yes. school, cor school was destroyed by a tornado. So uh, we want more of our schools to take advantage of this grant. But my bill allows the school to, to borrow from the Indiana Common School Fund, a fund that's there for school corporations to borrow money for a building project, for instance, to match that grant, the 25% mm -hmm. that the school has to come up with can be borrowed right. from the Common School Fund. Hopefully, uh, more schools across our state will begin to take advantage of it. I think that's a great one because all our kids need to be protected when they're not, you know, in a storm. There's mm -hmm. no place. You can't leave the building and go find safety. You've got to well, that's right. seek it in the building. And you'll probably notice, uh, Deb, but my theme <laughs> seems to always be along public safety lines because I do chair the Veterans Affairs and Public Safety Committee. And, and so you were a firefighter for that, years. That's right, 26 years. So so the safety of our child, whether they're riding a bike or whether they're at school, uh, are, are equally important to me. Well, now we have one more that's really a big one. Yeah, it's a, lot, it's a big one. You're <laughs> this, this one affects a lot of lives. It does, and as children as, as well. Though. Yes, and that's the jail overcrowding. Well, and and this is a uh, this is a, a huge process, as you mentioned, Deb. Um, and what what we uh, started with last year uh, was a bill that created a task force, a statewide task force, right. to look into why our jails are overcrowded. Um, it has long been my opinion that uh, building a larger jail is treating the symptom and not the root problem. And so. Um, I represent part of Jennings County as well, and so Jennings County was suffering from a real problem with their overcrowded jail, and it got me interested in it, and I started looking into why are jails overcrowded. Obviously, they're overcrowded because there's prisoners there, but why are they there, and how do we keep them from coming to jail, or how do we keep them from returning to jail after they're released? And so what we found, uh, first and foremost, was we didn't have any real-time data. We don't know as a state, each county knows, but each the state does not know how many people are in what jail, why they're there, how long they've been there, are they pre-trial or post-conviction, what's the adjudication of their case. Um, and so uh, we created a jail overcrowding task force to dig into that. And you found some of the things were like minor offenses were in jail a long period of time waiting yeah. for a court case. That's right, and uh, and there's several reasons for that, by the way. But uh, an awful lot of people are actually served more time pre-trial than their conviction. Yes, uh, which there's reasons for that as well. Um, so the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Loretta Rush, uh, was the chair. She graciously accepted to be the chair. I created a task force in House Enrolled Act 1065. And it was uh, other other folks were on it, like legislators, like the sheriffs' association, prosecutors' association, public defenders' association. Um, we brought in uh, all the parties uh, that we could think of to involved. Involved. Mm -hmm. That's right. To help us come to a conclusion of what these problems really are. What's the root cause? And so uh, we dug into it. And we got a report back in early December, and it is, uh, it's only an 18 page report, but it's a very heavy lift. Um, and it will take us a number of years to, uh, to begin to really make an impact here. But what we found was that what, what problem might be common in one county isn't a problem at all in another county. And then, um, so we have inconsistencies. We have lack of, of real time data to even know where those inconsistencies exist. Uh, we have issues with bail. Frankly, um, we found out that if you uh, come to trial with an attorney, uh, a good attorney, your chances of going home on bail are pretty good. Yes. And if you come to, to your original, uh, initial hearing uh, without an attorney, your chances of going to jail are pretty good. And so uh, we're looking at a pilot program this year in a piece of legislation that I've authored uh, to find out if we provide a public defender at your initial hearing when your bond is set, uh, will that affect the population of the jail? Will people go home who might not have uh, gone home earlier or, or otherwise? Um, that's just, a, again, another part of that uh, new legislation that's out this year. 
Uh, we are creating a database, a statewide database, to collect the data so we can dig into it and find out um, what issues are, are where. Um, so there's there's several aspects to that um, the, to the jail overcrowding that we're trying to fix now, and and most of what we're trying to do now is pretty much um, the low hanging fruit. Uh, the the report didn't come out till early uh, December, and here we are January with the session already going on. So we'll continue to study it this summer. And part of what my bill this year does is it rolls the jail overcrowding task force into another agency, so it continues to study these uh, these issues. Uh, we are not anywhere near done uh, studying this issue, so uh, we've got a long way to go, but we are addressing it. Well, with all this studying, you can figure out how many people, um, if they have a minor conviction, which one of those can actually go home until their trial. Mm. And then they can still be paying their house payment and, and raising well, their kids. Well, so, that's and, so true. Um, yeah. And uh, I think the important way, at least the way, way I look at it is, people I'm mad at, they can go home. People I'm afraid of, they have to stay in jail. Uh, so um, we, need to, we need to determine which is which. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very careful. Let me be clear about this. We need to be very careful. Any adjustments that we make here has to protect the public first. Right. So we can't make a mistake. And, and someone asked me yesterday, well, what's taking you so long to get these this data? Well, the truth is we got to go be careful that we don't cause the problem to be worse. Maybe we let people out of jail, but then we have people on the street who don't belong on the street. Yes. And we can't have that. So that's a big part of it as well. Well, by you including all those entities to do the study, you have you have everything from the police officer all the way up to the court justice. So that's true. That that's helps true. you give a better understanding. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue to study it, and we're going to continue to try to work to make the lives of individuals better. Um, an example, for instance, you have two individuals who commit the same crime, no no violence, no weapon involved, and they they both are incarcerated. They both have their initial bond hearing. The one individual has uh, enough money for bail. And so that individual goes home, has a court date set for 60 days later. Um, the other individual doesn't have bail money and ends up going to jail. They both come to court on the same day, 60 days later. The cases are settled ex identically the same and would appear on the surface to be a level playing field. Uh, the one, one individual has been in jail for 60 days. The other one's been out for 60 days and the adjudication of their cases are the same. They get, a, they get a, a probation, they get a fine, and they get community service. However, the individual that was in jail for 60 days has lost his job, yes. his car, his house, or his apartment. His children may be at DCS or in a foster home, and so his sentence is practically a life sentence for something that he didn't even get a day of jail time and he served 60 days in jail when he didn't get jail time at all he simply couldn't make bail right. so we got we have to figure that one out and uh, we got to figure out how to how to stop that and let people get back into their lives and uh, and uh, keep things going keep paying for their their homes and their lives i mean imagine losing your job but maybe you had eight or ten years seniority and now what do you do how do you get how do you get your job back and uh, how, how do you get any job and is it going to pay anywhere near what you were making and you have to start over um, and maybe you don't even have anything to drive if your vehicle's been repossessed if you missed right. two payments you may have lost your vehicle so uh, all those things uh, come into play here um, and we just have to be careful that we don't move too fast. Well, I think you're doing it the right way by using all the resources you can to make a decision. Well, I think so, and uh, we're, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from everyone from law enforcement to prosecutors to public defenders and, and so on, uh, that we are doing things right and doing them the right way. Uh, we just got to continue because this is not going to be an easy fix. Well, we're going to Take a break for a minute and we're going to hear from our sponsors and then we'll be right back with the rest of legislation with Randy Fry. Down here we like good coffee that's freshly brewed and breakfast that suits your fancy. Like a sausage biscuit with egg or sausage gravy and biscuit now just two bucks each. McDonald's. Southern inspired, Southern approved. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Welcome back. I'm Debbie Crawford and we're here with legislation and Randy Fry's come in to help us out with some of this stuff. But we're going to take a little turn here and we're going to talk about something he's very passionate about. You are on a caucus and what 
which one is it you're on? I'm the chairman of the Motorsports Caucus. And the Motorsports Caucus is an informal caucus uh, that promotes uh, motorsports around the state, around the country, and even around the world. Right. Uh, Debbie, as you know, Indiana is king of motorsports. We have the greatest spectacle in racing, the Indy 500. Uh, we have the Brickyard 400, which is a NASCAR race well known throughout the country. Um, we have the NHRA U.S. Nationals uh, every Labor Day weekend. And then we also have a little uh, event you might be aware of <laughs> called the Madison Regatta right yes. here. So uh, Indiana is well, well versed in motorsports. So when people talk about motorsports in Indiana, it's not just race cars or the hydroplanes or the Red Bull races with the airplanes right. or more motorcycles. It's all of it. It is all of it. And it's also uh, not only fun. Uh, you know, I love race cars. I even like to drive them. But uh, what it is, it's huge industry for the state. Uh, the, uh, the amount of jobs that are here, the um, amount of uh, wages, the wages are great, about $63,000 a year average wage for those who work in the industry yes. uh, is uh, just um, uh, fantastic for those in that industry, but it's for all Hoosiers um, because it helps our economy as a state. It's, it's a very big economic impact to the state. It's huge. It's a huge economic driver, yes. and uh, we've been so blessed to have it over the years. You know, I've heard the Indy 500 referred to as the equal to the Super Bowl, and we have it every year. The Super Bowl go, travels around the nation. People, uh, uh, cities bid for it and, and right. buy for it, but we get the Indy 500 every year. Oh, and uh, the yeah. month of May in Indianapolis, if you've not been there, is amazing. I just love it. Now, out of all the counties in Indiana, almost every one of them has all, a racing. All 92 counties are affected. Uh, right. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it's just not just in Indianapolis or or even a Madison. It's all over the all over the state. All over the state. Mm -hmm. So there's actually 421,000 that are indirectly impacted right. by the sport. Well, and 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 that could be anything from. Uh, uh, transportation, uh, hauling race cars, it could be building chassis, building engines, uh, it could be catering, uh, any, of the, uh, any of the industries that are supportive of motor racing. And you, you've been right here in Madison for the regatta and what a wonderful event that is and, and seeing all the different uh, vendors that are here, they're all here because of a motorsports event. And so that makes it I mean, there's like 23,000 jobs directly, directly affected impact. by the motorsports. That's right, Deb. And the, those directly are the people who build the race car or the mm -hmm. people who, who uh, drive the race car, for that matter. And many of the drivers uh, for Indiana, uh, for Indy, IndyCar, live here in Indiana, as well as some pretty uh, famous ones you might have heard of. Tony Stewart would be one not too far from here up in Columbus. And, so we have a rich heritage of uh, auto racing here in, this, in our state. So there, there are some things that are going to be happening with motorsports. Mm. Um, we have a unique thing that's already happened with mm. the Indy Speedway. Indianapolis now. Motor Speedway, yeah. yes. Uh, well, uh, the uh, Tony Holman uh, was purchased the Indianapolis Motor Speedway right after World War II, I believe. And uh, his family, uh, Tony Holman and Holman family, and then the, the Holman George family, uh, Tony George, his grandson, uh, and, and their family have owned the Annapolis Motor Speedway since the time Tony bought it until this past Monday. And the, the uh, Speedway was transferred at that time uh, to Penske Racing, and Mr. Roger Penske is now the owner of the Annapolis Motor Speedway and the uh, IndyCar Racing Series as well. So. Uh, we all know Mr. Penske. He's uh, uh, very successful both in NASCAR. He's and, amazing. And he is amazing. Oh. Uh, he's an incredible businessman right. besides his success in racing. And his, his teams have won the 8500 many times. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, I think it's just a wonderful uh, opportunity for the Speedway to go to the next level, as our governor would say, uh, to take it to the next level. Mr. Penske and his uh, associations looking really they're looking forward to uh, expanding and making it even a greater uh, event oh I think they will they've already got some plans in place that they do there's gonna be some some prizes this yeah. racing season so and I think you'll see things uh, interesting things I I'm not uh, privy to any information but I think you'll see maybe a, a, 
uh, F1 may be back. Formula One may come back. And, you know, we've got a really good road course in there now where when uh, Formula One was here before, the road course wasn't nearly as good as it is today. So let's hope that comes back. That gives us world attention. And uh, the F1 fans, they bring a lot of revenue with them when they come to visit. I'd like to see the airplane races come back. Uh, the Red Bull uh, yes, races. Yes, I love those. There. That's pretty amazing, too. And if you haven't seen that, it was uh, held at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for a number of years. Uh, they would actually take off and land in the infield, and uh, then the uh, Gasoline Alley, an area this side, beside Gasoline Alley was their hangar where they uh, worked on their aircraft. So that was a pretty amazing thing as well. Well, we're going to try to make sure we have, once they set their actual schedule for the year, we're going to try to make sure we get it out there because it's going to be different. It's going to be new. Mm -hmm. And uh, so be more opportunities for different. More opportunities, and uh, certainly uh, we're looking forward to a great uh, Madison Regatta as well. I know. Now that's really coming together too. It that's, is coming together. There's a lot of things happening with the regatta. It's it's yeah. early in the season, yeah. but well, stay tuned. We uh, we look forward to having some really interesting things to announce in uh, in the coming few weeks. Yes, but it, it takes time to put things together. There's a lot of meetings that have to happen, and you have to look at all your possibilities, and then that's so true. And and we are going to a lot of meetings, as you know. And I want to give a shout out to Matt uh, True for all his work. He's such a dedicated guy and we're doing some great things but yes. but I, I just want your uh, viewers to know that having an event like the Madison Regatta has the heritage with it you can't buy you can't get that someplace else you might have right. another hydroplane race but it would never be the Madison Regatta no. and so protecting that heritage and and building on that is something that we must do it is uh, similar in its nature to the heritage of the Indy 500. The U.S. Nationals has been out at Lucas Oil Raceway now for many, many years on Labor Day weekend. And uh, so we want to make sure that we maximize that heritage and uh, bring that race back to greatness. I think it's it's going to be amazing this year. And, you know, in the past, there's been people that weren't able to come to the race. Hmm. So, but because they wanted to support it, they went ahead and bought a wristband, which mm -hmm. is a great way to support the regatta. Mm -hmm. Or if they were just going to you know, read it in the paper, they still, they would buy a wristband so they mm -hmm. could support it. And that's a great thing to do. It is. It's great for the community and uh, for those folks that are willing to do that. We appreciate it. Yes. That, well, every penny goes somewhere in that event. <laughs> they make sure. Well, that's true. And hopefully we can continue to uh, improve the regatta. I'm just delighted to be a tiny little part of, of trying to make the regatta better. Well, anybody's help is appreciated. And, and you gone above and beyond on this one. I know you've been in a lot of meetings over this. Well, it's a lot of fun, and I know our governor is 100% behind it. You know, he hasn't missed it, a regatta yet. I know. And, yeah. uh, you know, he's a Hanover grad and uh, loves this area and uh, and loves coming to town. He can't miss Hinkles when he comes to town, but he's a big-time fan of the regatta as well. Well, we'll see how much fun we get to have this year, and we'll, we'll know I look soon. To it. I do too. I'm excited about it. So, is there anything else with legislation we need to let people know, like what they need to do to contact you or someone about the legislation? Mm -hmm. Well, you can always contact me by my cell phone. My cell phone's on my business card. It's three one seven five one two zero one two eight. Um, and uh, you can go to the Indiana General Assembly webpage. All the la all the bills are on the webpage, and so you can look at them and see uh, if you like a bill, you don't like a bill. You can see who authored the bill. Uh, if it's going to get a hearing, it's important, I think, for your listeners to know that um, anyone can draft a bill for any subject. That doesn't mean it's going anywhere. Right. Unless a bill is heard by a committee. Uh, unless it's passed by a committee and moved on to the Senate floor, the House floor, it's just a bill. It's right. just something that's on paper. So it's important to watch them, whether you like them or you don't, but uh, not not to fret if you see a bill come out and you go, oh my goodness, I don't like that. Well, there are lots of bills that get drafted and don't ever go anywhere. Right. But they do need to call and let you all know how they feel about that bill. They can do that. They can find me on Facebook. They can send me an email at right. the State House. A lot of different ways, and then a lot of folks come by the State House. Uh, we we see a lot of folks from Farm Bureau at the State House from this county. Right. Now, there's one thing that's really neat that I, I like what you do. If you tell Randy you don't like something about a bill, he'll say, "Okay, now what's the plan to fix it?" So <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's kind of my way. If you talk to Randy, you're going to have to have a plan <laughs> to back up what you're saying. So that, just heads up on that one. 
So, but that's helpful though. Sometimes you find out things you didn't know before. Well, and I it think helps all you of us learn a few things. Uh, sometimes the folks who are opposed to a bill don't understand. Other right. times they understand very clearly and they need me to understand. So right. yeah, it's good to have that discussion. Well, this is great. I'm really glad you came in today. Thanks for having me. Well, we're going to try to do this more often. We are. We are. And, and stay tuned. We've only gone through the first week of session. I know. We have nine more weeks to go. Uh, a lot of good things are happening. And uh, buckle up and hang on. Well, we'll just see how many good things come out. So I'm, I'm excited. I know a few things that you've got coming up, so I, I think they're going to be beneficial. So. Good. Well, we appreciate Randy Fry being in today. My pleasure. And as always, we appreciate our sponsors. They are amazing, and they help us put all this stuff on. So thank you for watching.